Dearly beloved, I'm very happy to welcome you to the second episode of our Lenten Catechesis. And tonight we shall be reflecting on Lent, Childhood and the Bible. Now, the reason why we're reflecting on the theme of childhood, as I said last week, is practically because um, in the Archdiocese of Accra, our theme for the entire year is focused on childhood. And indeed, we're reading, um, we wish to see Jesus from John chapter 12, verse 21, as our theme for the year. And that is why in this second episode, we want to look at the theme of Lent, childhood, and the Bible. Now, to do that, we will be doing tonight um, two main passages of Scripture. We shall be studying um, two passages of Scripture in, in depth. Uh, and the first one will be Lenten lessons from the Bible's first children. Genesis chapter 4, 1 to 15. Over there, we shall be discussing the story of Cain and Abel, and we shall see what we can learn from the Bible's first children, the sons of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. The second thing we shall be looking at is when the child gets lost. Returning, restoring, and reconciliation. We shall be taking that from Luke's Gospel, chapter 15. So uh, this is what we shall be doing tonight. First, Lenten lessons from the Bible's first children, Genesis chapter 4, and when the child gets lost returning, restoring, and reconciliation. Now, beloved, tonight we want to begin with the story of Cain and Abel. And what can we learn from the Bible's first children? Now, the story of Cain and Abel in the Bible is a very, very interesting story. Um, why actually did Cain kill his brother Abel. It is not very clear. In fact, if we read from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 11, reading from verse 4, it says, By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he received approval as righteous, God bearing witness by accepting his gifts. This is Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. So according to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, it seems as if um, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice. Now, if you go again into 1 John chapter 3, reading from verse 12, it says, And do not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. And you can see that from um, the two passages that we've read from Hebrews and from 1 John, there are actually different reasons assigned to the reason why Cain killed Abel. According to uh, the letter to the Hebrews, it appears as if Abel's offering was more acceptable than Cain's offering. But if you read from 1 John chapter 3, it says that it was because Cain's deeds were evil and his brothers righteous. What exactly is the reason why Cain killed Abel? In the passage from Genesis chapter 4 itself, it is not very clear. In fact, no explicit reason is given. But we need to dig a little deeper to be able to find out if we can understand and if we can learn any lessons during this Lent from the Bible's first children. Now, let's go now to our passage then and read from Genesis chapter 4 and reading from verse 1. And it says, Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. In verse 2, and again, 
she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a tiller of the ground. This is Genesis chapter 4, reading from verses 1 and 2. Now there are two things, two little details which are uh, quite important in this short passage which we've read. The first and foremost, it says that um, Eve conceived and bore Cain. And then in verse 2, and again she bore his brother Abel. So the first thing that we learn is that Cain was the firstborn and Abel was the secondborn. So Cain was the elder son. Abel was the younger son. The other detail is that it says, now Abel was a keeper of sheep. He was a shepherd. Cain, a tiller of the ground. He was a farmer. Now what actually is the meaning of this? And what are the implications of these two details that we are seeing? Well, first and foremost, um, is the question that in this short two verses, it's very clear that uh, it's emphasized that Cain is the firstborn. Cain is the firstborn son. Now we know that in the Bible, uh, being the firstborn made a person um, have the right to inheritance. So the firstborn was the one who inherited his father's property, his father's goods. So for instance, if you read from Genesis chapter 27, verse 1 and verse 4, it says, When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son. And he answered, Here I am. And in verse 4, he says, Prepare for me savory food, such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat and that I may bless you before I die. So the firstborn was the one who had the blessing of the father. He was the one who would inherit everything that the father had. The firstborn was the one who inherited. He was first uh, and he was the one who inherited. So it means, for instance, that all the property of the father, if the father had land, if the father had animals, if the father had anything, it was the firstborn who would inherit. That means that Cain was, if you like, the favorite son. He was the one who would inherit almost everything that Adam possessed. And if Adam was the first man and everything that you know God had created practically belonged to Adam, then it means that Adam and that Cain was the one who would inherit practically everything. As for Abel, the younger son, um, not much. Um, he would more or less be uh, subordinate to his brother. So Cain was, if you like, the privileged son. The privileged son. Again, it says that Cain was the tiller of the ground and Abel was a shepherd. And what is the meaning of that? Now, in ancient times, in antiquity, in ancient times, practically there were only two main occupations that people, you know, had. Someone was either a farmer or he was a shepherd. Those were the two main occupations of antiquity. And in the Bible, most of the people that we read about are either farmers or they are shepherds. But there was an interesting and important difference. The farmer was definitely superior to the shepherd. Why? Because the farmer was the one first and foremost who owned the land on which the shepherd would bring his animals. So the, the farmer was the landowner. Apart from that, the farmer was the one who was technologically advanced. He was the one who knew the seasons, when to plant, when to harvest, when to plow, and so on and so forth. So farming was definitely more technologically advanced than a nomadic life where you carry your animals and go in search and anywhere you find grass or water, you give them to drink. So the farmer was far more technologically advanced. Secondly, the farmer was the person who was stable. The nomad, the shepherd would go, you know, everywhere. He didn't have a house of his own. He didn't have, 
He couldn't, you know, he, he didn't have buildings. He only lived in a tent. But no, the farmer was the one who would build because he had a sedentary lifestyle. He would remain in one place. And therefore, the farmer was the builder of cities. He was the builder of cities. If anyone was going to become king, it wasn't the nomad. It was the farmer. So it's very interesting in the story how Cain is placed. He is the privileged son. Number one, he's the firstborn. Number two, he's the farmer. Now, that really is the first problem of our story. How on earth and for what reason will somebody who is more privileged, who is the farmer, who is the firstborn, why on earth would he be jealous about his brother, who was only a shepherd, who would inherit next to nothing? Why does somebody who is privileged rise up against somebody who is less privileged? Does it make sense? Is it even rational? That is the, problem, the first problem of the story. Now let us go on continue, and continue to read our story. Um, if you read from verse 5 and following, it says, So Cain was very angry. Why? Because God accepted the sacrifice of Abel. And his countenance fell. And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. And its desire is for you. But you must master it. And in verse 8, Cain said to Abel, his brother, let us go out to the field. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Genesis chapter 4 and reading from verses 5 through 8. Now, this second part of the story tells us the nature of temptation. The nature of temptation. Now, we have already seen that it was almost crazy, it was almost irrational because Cain was the more endowed of the brothers. Why on earth did he rise up? Why was he jealous? Why was he angry at his brother Abel? Why did he slay his brother Abel? Now in this passage, especially in verse 7, it says God warns Cain and says to him, sin is crouching at the door. Now, what does it mean sin is crouching? What, is, what does it mean to crouch? Crouching is the posture of a ferocious animal, like a leopard, a lion, a beast that is ready to spring and to devour its prey. And this is the word that is used. Sin is crouching. So sin is portrayed in the words of God in this passage, as if sin is a wild beast, an irrational animal. Then God goes on to say, but you must master it. You must, as it were, master it. You must tame it. You must have dominion over it. In fact, the word that is used in the Hebrew Bible for you must master it, master it, is the same word which is used when God creates um, the, our first parents, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 1, reading from verses 26, 27, and following 28, where God says that, I have given you dominion, mastery, over the, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and all the wild beasts that creep or crawl upon the land. It is that same word that is used. So you realize that in the book of Genesis, God had already given the power of mastery to Adam over everything that he had created. So even if sin is a wild beast, even if it's like a lion, God had given 
Abel, he had given Cain, he had given Adam, he had given Eve the power to have dominion over it, to master it. But it is about our own choice. So what is the nature of temptation? Temptation is like a ferocious, irrational beast crouching, ready to spring and to cause damage. But God has also given to humankind the ability to have mastery, to have dominion over it. Now, what is even quite interesting is if you go into the book of Jude, the letter of Jude, I should say, this is the letter of Jude chapter 1 and reading from verses 10 to 11. Very interesting passage of scripture. It says, by these men revile whatever they do not understand, and by those things they know, by instinct, as irrational animals do, they are destroyed. Woe to them, for they walk in the way of Cain. A very interesting passage of scripture. So the way of Cain, the behavior of Cain, was like an irrational animal. And that is what sin is like. Like a beast that only acts, as it says, on instinct, not rationally. Why does Cain kill Abel? Because he's allowing sin to be like an irrational animal. And it's irrational because God has blessed Cain more than Abel. He's given him the land. He's a farmer. He's technologically advanced. He has everything more than Abel. And yet... He's not satisfied. He's still jealous of his brother who has much less. Now that therefore is the nature of temptation. Temptation is like an irrational animal. And you know sometimes when we are tempted, we actually behave a little irrationally. You imagine when you are tempted to anger sometimes. You, you behave almost irrationally. When we are tempted to gluttony, when we are tempted to pride, think of it. Sometimes temptations are truly like irrational beasts. And sometimes when we behave in, when we are tempted and when we succumb to temptation, we are almost bestial in our actions. So that is the nature of temptation. But God has given us the capacity to master, to master sin. Let's continue with our story. The next part of our story goes to sin and its consequences. In fact, reading from um, verse 8 again, it says, Cain said to his brother, let us go out to the field. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer. On the end. This is from Genesis chapter 4, 8 to 12. The third thing that we're learning from the first children of the Bible is that sin has its consequences. And in this passage, this short passage which we have read, we'll actually see that there are three consequences of sin. The first one, God asks Cain, where is your brother Abel? The first consequence of sin is the rapture between brothers. The rapture between sisters. Sin causes us to be distant from our brother. It causes the relationship between brothers, between sisters to be broken. Where is your brother? That is the first consequence of sin. Sin brings division between us 
as children of God. What is the second? The second one, it says in verse 12, when you till the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. Sin affects creation. It doesn't only affect the relationship between us and our fellow human beings, our brothers and our sisters. It affects creation. And we in Ghana have a great opportunity to think about how sin is devastating God's creation. Look at what greed has done to our rivers, to our land, to our forests. People mining irresponsibly out of greed. And because of that, they do not care that they poison the earth, pour heavy metal, cyanide, and so on and so forth into the ground, killing the flora and the fauna. The forests are gone. The fish can no longer survive in the water. Microorganisms can no longer thrive. And it's bringing back diseases to us. The consequence of sin is not only to our neighbor, it even affects our relationship with the environment, with God's creation. And therefore today you eat food and instead of getting strength, it's rather bringing you illness. And isn't that what is said in this passage in verse 12? It says, when you till the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. That is the rapture between us and the earth that God has created. The third is the rapture between us and God. And in verse 11, it says, and now you are cursed. And now you are cursed. But we read at the beginning um, in Genesis, when God created Adam and Eve, it says he blessed them. And he said, increase and multiply and fill the earth. But now here, because of sin, it says you are cursed. And the curse is an indication of the rapture between man and God who is the source of every blessing. Sin, therefore, has consequences. It leads to the rapture with my brother, with my sister. It leads to disharmony with creation. And it leads to distance from God. Sin, therefore, has terrible, terrible consequences. Now, what now about repentance and restoration? Which is the last thing we find in the last part of this passage. Let us read from Genesis chapter 4, reading from verses 15, 13 through 15. It says, Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me this day away from the ground and from thy face, and I shall be hidden, and I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the air, and whoever finds me will slay me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone slays Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest anyone who came upon him should kill him. Now, the beginning, even after Cain does what he does, that is not the end of the story. Sin is not the final word. Indeed, the first thing that Cain does is he says, my punishment is greater than I can bear. He acknowledges that he has done something wrong and that he has been punished for it. And he goes to God. He dialogues with God because of the situation in which he is. Sin must lead to repentance. It must lead to an acknowledgement of the fact that we have sinned against God. And an acknowledgement that we have rightly deserved the punishment that we have received for our sins. But we must be ready to do something about it. And that is what we can see with King. He goes back to God. Even in his uh, evil deeds, even in his wickedness, he still goes back to speak with God. That is the beginning of repentance. 
the ability to rise from where we have fallen and go back to have a conversation with God. And Cain, even though he has committed murder, does not run away from God. He goes back to appeal to God to forgive him and to lessen his punishment. And then we see in verse 15 what God says. God says, no, not so. If anyone slays Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. I want you to underline the word sevenfold. Now, what? why is that word sevenfold important? Later on, when we read from the book of Leviticus, we shall understand that seven signifies the jubilee. The jubilee year. When in the seven times seventh year, God says that anyone who is in debt ought to be forgiven his debt. Anyone who has sinned ought to be released from the bonds of, of that. And this sevenfold is an indication that there is salvation, there is restoration, there is forgiveness, even for Cain. There is no sin. That is beyond God's mercy. There is no sin that is beyond God's intervention. And even though Cain has put, has, has killed his brother Abel, God will protect him. God will put a mark on Cain so that nobody can carry out vengeance. It is an act of mercy for Cain. In, indeed, what God should have done was to say, well, you killed Abel and therefore you're also going to die. But no, even for Cain, there is mercy. Dearly beloved, this is what we have looked at in our first um, part of the series. We have looked at the lessons that can be derived, the lessons that can be learned from what Cain and Abel went through. We've learned what is important, what lessons we can learn from the first children that are mentioned in the Bible. We have learned about the irrationality of sin. We have learned about the nature of temptation, which is completely and totally irrational. We have also learned that sin has its consequences and those consequences affect the relationship that we have with one another, the relationship that we have with creation and the relationship that we have with God. But we have also learned that no matter what sin a person might have committed, there is always an opportunity to go back and to dialogue with God to feel sorry and to repent and to be restored because God always forgives and there is the opportunity for each one of us to benefit from his mercy. May God bless you and in our next episode, we shall be looking at learning something from the story of the prodigal son. God bless you.